Hello, my name is Andrew Collins and I'm a telly addict. Well, this is the 100th telly addict I've written and read out since May 2011. And what a journey it's been. Remember this clip from the very first one? It's probably rose tinted. But it felt like we were actually... Happy. Now, I don't remember much about Exile on BBC One either, but it was TV's first Alzheimer's thriller, so maybe that's apt. And it had this actress in it. Jesus, you must be in the shit. Whatever happened to Olivia Colman? The real question is, I wonder what'll happen to Olivia Colman now ITV's smash hit Broadchurch has ended. Go somewhere else, give the kids a fresh start. Your life is here. How can I walk down the high street now? What about you? He'll be in everything, just like you will. But there's no denying the long-range emotional power of Coleman's performance in Broadchurch, whose finale either paid off the previous seven episodes of Suspicion Creep adequately or inadequately, delete as applicable. For me, it was the getting there that counted, and the getting there was good. Oh, I'm done. Medical though, it's all over. Look at us, former detectives club. And that's surely how they'll get a second series out of Miller and Hardy. I'd watch it. We didn't have to wait long to see David Tennant again. He left Dorset on Monday and, with just enough time to paint the ceiling, turned up in Westminster on Thursday as the politician's husband on BBC Two. A luxurious 18 years after the politician's wife for Channel 4, writer Paula Milne returns to the fertile topsoil of parliamentary matrimony, but in the Balls Cooper era. With Tennant as the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, who resigns in a failed leadership bid and has to face less work and more pension. With barely enough time to reconnect with his obligatory autistic son, his mousy rising star of a wife, Emily Watson, is manoeuvred into work and pensions by the very Machiavellis who manoeuvred him out. So Tennant turns armchair Machiavelli and starts picking out his wife's outfits. They're a bit Theresa May, aren't they? Gives a twelve. I forgot rule number one. To stay top dog, you may have to unleash the bitch within you, Freya. Don't be afraid of that. Political drama has a get out of dramatic jail free card. The characters are allowed to make speeches where ordinary civilians might make conversation. This is fun for the writer and actors, sometimes less so for us. Although I was impressed that we got 38 minutes into the first episode before this obligatory cliche was used after the obligatory jogging scene. Blair never sat Gordon Brown because it was safer having him on the inside of the tent pissing out than on the outside pissing in. Politicians do talk in clichés, so maybe this is gritty realism. Realism up to a point, in any case. And that point is the obligatory, unconvincingly mocked-up tabloid headlines. Slow news day for The Sun. And what a shame all of its headline writers were on holiday. A disappointing eye-off-the-ball moment for the props department there, who had the mocked-up cabinet meeting room down to a T. Give or take a couple of windows on the far wall at the end, but let's not be too anal. On points, my approval rating for the politician's husband is just about high enough to lure me back for more. The supporting cast is Sterling, Jack Shepherd, Ed Stoppard, the criminally underused Roger Allen, and it's implicit from this scene in the cabinet office that Watson's mouth is destined to roar. Feel the almost sexual hum of power coming off that blotter. Someone more eagle-eyed than me spotted that Milne has named all of her characters after characters in what some might regard as a slightly more substantial political drama, The West Wing. Hoynes, Lyman, Brock, Moss, Babish, Bailey, Hooper, look them up. It may be the shortest suicide note in history. While most TV drama aims for wits, Sky Arts are asking us instead to feel the quality. John! I used to say... Life's what happens when you're making other plans. The second half-hour standalone play in its Playhouse Presents strand was Snodgrass by David Quantic. I used to say, suddenly you're 40 and there's so much left to do. I've known David Quantic for 25 years, but I haven't seen him for ages, so you'll have to trust my impartiality. I used to say, I want bop a loo bop, I want bam boom. And imagine day in the life of John Lennon if he'd left the Beatles in 1962. It was a gleaming gem. I used to say a lot of things. 
Ian Hart has inherited Lennon twice before, in Christopher Monk's chamber piece The Hours and the Times and Ian Softley's conventional biopic Backbeat. Snodgrass gave us an altogether less cool Dr Winston O'Boogie. 51 and on the dole. I've got a letter. Excuse me while I rifle through me back pages. No, well, I've said enough. He was crap anyway. Blowing out the wind, more likely I used to say. I've been summoned by ye job centre to see... Oh no, I can't read that without me glasses. Played in the saddest key of all, Snodgrass gave Lennon back his wisecracks, but instead of being lapped up by the world's press at airports or around an Amsterdam hotel bed, they echoed off grey walls of administrative indifference. This was the only Hilton the alternative Lennon was going to. Based on a short story by a science fiction writer and alternative historian I can't pretend to have ever heard of called Ian R. McLeod, the film's Beatles references were never heavy-handed. Oh, well, 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 talk of ye devil. Note, How Do You Do What You Do To Me, which the Beatles recorded as their first single, but which was scrapped in favour of Love Me Do. And when one of the terrestrial broadcasters starts commissioning and funding half-hour standalone plays, maybe all the acting and writing talent being greedily gobbled up by Sky will come back. Oh, and a nod to former Boo Radley, Martin Carr, who wrote the lovely fake Lennon songs. Still That was him. The BBC is still serious about comedy, of course, as proven by The Right Way, a very serious comedy indeed, written by someone called Ben Elton. Victoria won't get out of the bathroom. Well, she will do, Dad, when she's finished. She's female, Susan. She's in a bathroom. She's never going to be finished. <laughs> no? Try this one. Well, phase one will begin with a bump alignment level location situation. A B A double L S. Good that the cardboard cutout health and safety man actually spelt it out. A Ben Elton joke leaves no slow coach behind. <laughs> Sizing procedure. You. <laughs> it's rather a solemn moment, really, isn't it? No need to editorialise, other than to add, I used to love Ben Elton. On an even less funny note, the semi finals of MasterChef reached a new pitch of cruelty on BBC One when two previously dazzling contenders fell foul of visiting MasterChef hating monster Marcus Waring in the fine dining round. Some viewers may find the following scenes distressing. It's as far away from fine dining. As North Pole, South Pole. Wait, Dale's not crying yet. Give him another helping. Um, and if you took the source out of the equation, it's not very good. Time for John to join in the bullying because he wants to get in with the bully and not the victim. You can't keep on reinventing the wheel, Dale. Don't worry, mate. Don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. Assassination doesn't get much tougher than this. Although it was Greg who played the social worker. Yeah, shake me hand. You're alright. Sorry, I can't be in the car. It's okay. It's alright. It's alright. It's alright. They say that the quality of the amateur cooks on this series has reached a new level of invention and skill, which explains the high stakes. I just hope next year the judges don't actually force anybody's head into a deep fat fryer. I'm absolutely speechless. I think that's appalling. Is it too late to withdraw my application? On a lighter competitive cookery note, it's sad that the BBC lost the rights to Mad Men and its tiny audience, but Don Draper's copywriter Stan managed to squeeze in a plug for one of the corporation's better loved shows this week. Ted, you want to come in? I hope you left us something. It's a bake off? Can't wait for August. I haven't got time this week to review the latest transatlantic pre-enlightenment sex and sandals drama, Da Vinci's Demons, but look who made a surprising cameo in episode one. Out you go, boy. Host Hugh Bonneville centering himself backstage at the Olivier Awards there. Well, this has been the 100th Telly Addict. As ever, let me know what you think of the programmes I've reviewed, not the review itself. I've done that for you. So what we're looking at here, Team Health and Safety, is a complete balls up. <laughs> Cheers.